Today on Quest, survivor of two near-death experiences, Peter Panagor. Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hi everyone, I'm your host, Todd Fisher, and this is Season 2 of Quest. For those of you that might be new listeners, let me tell you a little about me. I'm the founder of Metatomics and the author of the best-selling book, Metatomics, The Grand Design. I'm a philosopher, a theorist, and a metaphysicist. I'm a perpetual pupil of theology and an expert in comparative religious study. I've also extensively researched the mind-body connection, anatomy, and physiology. I'm a researcher and a storyteller. And in order to tell this story, the research is necessary, and part of the research is the search. And that brings us to why I created the Quest podcast. A quest is a search for something, and this podcast will show you how we know what we know through interviews with people that have incredible stories of dedication and perseverance. To me, curiosity is part of what makes us human, and there's still so much we don't know. There's joy in discovery. It's what drives us. It's our quest. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Quest Podcast. Today, my interview is with Peter Panagor. Peter was a college student ice climbing on his spring break when mistakes on the mountain caused him to die from hypothermia. He shares the aftermath of his near-death experience and much more right now. Enjoy the interview. Hi, Peter. Welcome to the Quest Podcast. Hey, Todd. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Great. I'm so uh, excited to talk to you today. You have such a, an interesting story I want to get into, something I've wanted to bring to the Quest podcast for a long time. You have actually had two near-death experiences, which is, I can't even fathom that. Like most people don't get one of those, much less get two, or if they've died and come back, ever had any recollection of what happened. And you have two incredible stories and you're going to share today and I want to I want to tell everyone a little about those and just kind of your experience uh, with it that's what we're going to talk about um, your first one now correct me if I'm wrong on these details but you've had two mm-hmm. NDEs and your first death occurred in 1980 from hypothermia while ice climbing in Canada and mm-hmm. your second was from a heart attack in 2015 is that is that accurate mm-hmm. yes wow so I want to get into the 1980 incident. But before we talk about that, tell me a little bit about your life before that. What was, what was early Peter like? What was your life like before that particular thing? Because I really want to use it in comparison to how your life might have changed afterwards. Tell me a little about your early life. I uh, grew up outside of Boston and uh, was in a hockey town where I didn't play hockey. I skied. And so I was kind of on the outs with my little community, but I was a Boy Scout. I went to Catholic high school. I was raised in the Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholic Church, a person of belief, and that plays into my story here today. Um, And I was a meditator. I I went to St. John's High School, which is outside of Worcester, Massachusetts, where my senior year, they taught us meditation. I, I, I I had a predisposition, you could say, toward mystical experience, but, but that's an entirely bigger story. Um, but I, it, my near-death experience, my first time I died, made all the rest of that stuff look like nothing. Wow. How, how old were you in 1980 when the, when the first occurrence happened? Well, I had just had my birthday and I was 21. 21. Wow. Yep. So you, you found yourself, so you grew up religious, and uh, yeah, and, but I was, a, you know, I was. I also grew up in a place 
you know, I was in the 1970s. I, I was smoking pot and hanging out with girls and, you know, doing <laughs> rock and roll, sex, drug and rock and roll was what we were all aspired to in our in our blazers and neckties. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Well, what got you into Canada for this, um, you know, for this ice climbing expedition? So you were with someone who was um, skilled at 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 ice climbing but you were a novice at this is that right true 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 no, i uh, i was in montana as an exchange student for a year at montana state university and i didn't want to, i didn't want to go home to boston for spring break and i was looking for a, a high adventure i was a high adventure i'd spent a lot of time in the um, high peaks i was a backpacking climber rock climber uh, national ski patrol and so I found a guy at the outdoor club who was taking a trip to Alberta and Banff and um, to spend a week snow caving, backcountry skiing and ice climbing. And I'd been, I'd been winter camping since I was a kid because I was a Boy Scout. So yeah. I was in. And so, uh, so I was in. And so I, I went up to uh, the, the week we spent at snow caving up there with Tim is the guy's name. And at the end of that week, we went to this world famous climb called Weeping Wall, lower Weeping Wall on a mountain called Cirrus Mountain, just north of Banff. And it wasn't very far off the ice fields parkway. It was walking distance, 15 minute stomp in the snow. And there were a whole bunch of teams there climbing that day. And I had convinced Tim and Tim agreed that I could climb with a hammer and an ax because I didn't have all the gear. So I, I came up with the gear, rented, borrowed, found, whatever. And I could only come up with one ax and a hammer. And we decided to make the ascent with that setup. And you can climb with a hammer. And I did, I climbed all the way up. But the problem was, is that I was exhausted by the time I got to the top because I could never rest. You can't mm. rest with a hammer in your hand. So right. you, have to, you have to always grip. And uh, that burned out both my forearms, which meant I had to take a lot of breaks, which delayed our climb all the way up. And so by the time we reached the top, it was sunset and all the other teams, a dozen teams, maybe half a dozen teams, it, 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 they were leaving and we were just at the top of the climb and we had prepared for a day like everybody else, no stove, no food, no sleeping bags, none of that kind of stuff because we were supposed to be off the mountain. Yeah. Sunset temperature dropped 30 degrees in minutes. It's the middle of March and we're a day's drive from the Arctic Circle and there's 10 feet of snow on the ground and it's a sweaty sport. So I was, uh, I was wet from sweat and we were out of water and out of food and the temperature dropped and we knew we were in trouble immediately. Uh, there was no, I, climbing is unlike backpacking in that if you're climbing a mountain and a backpack, you can turn around, but ice climbing, you can't turn around. There's no, there's no like halfway up and say, oh, you know, let's bag it for the day. You can't do that. Right. And so we had to climb and we, when we were sitting there side by side, uh, Tim hauled up this long rope that then he laid in because of the stress of the situation into a big knot rather than a cleanly laid line in the dark. The moon was down and there was a million stars so he could see somewhat in the, in the uh, available stellar light. And we immediately started having violent shivers because our temperatures dropped radically and we weren't dressed for a cold night. And so we were shaking. When I say I was shaking, it was like, like my entire body was a, a, a vibrator. It's like, but it was vibrating in inches and I couldn't, I, there was, I couldn't control anything. I mean, I moved my arms. I had, I had large control, but I couldn't stop everything from shaking, including my jaw. And that's really what began to make us understand because Tim was in the same position, how serious the situation was because hypothermia can kill you. And I knew this because I was on the ski patrol and I knew how it could kill you. And we decided that we were going to die there or die getting off the mountain. So I, I had to untie the knot, which meant I had to take my gloves off, which started frostbite in my hands. And so that took quite some time. How long? I don't know. Um, we traversed, we tied off to each other because it's still pretty dark out. We tied off to each other and we traversed across the face of, of the cliff on a, uh, a narrow trail 
and got to the first repel. And because hypothermia interferes with thinking, we made our next major mistake. And that was not using a piece of webbing, which is a, a nylon tube that's flat and you can you can tie it in a square knot, and make a very strong loop. You can tie, you can tow a car if you put it on your trailer and your and your pickup truck, you can tow your trailer with this in between. And so we take this webbing and and we're supposed to put it around the tree and then hang the rope through the webbing and well we didn't do that because we didn't want to waste the webbing because it was expensive. So we threw the rope around the tree and we repelled down this uh, what turned into uh, an, uh, an, an un, like an underhang where we had to you had to free you had to repel down through free space with no feet on the mountain. We get to this landing and the rope above got stuck on frozen to the tree, which is why you're supposed to use the webbing so it doesn't freeze to the tree, but it froze to the tree, and we couldn't get it free for a long hours, long hours. We we tried and finally Tim. Um, tied these knots called persic knots. They're ascending hitches. You can, you, if you pull put tension on them, they lock onto the rope at some high percentage, like 90% friction. You know, it's like, wow, really tight. So Tim ties these two persic hitches with loops to reascend up the rope, uh, which is on, in this underhang. And I wrapped the rope around me and it became this taut-ish line. And Tim began to ascend and he got maybe 20 feet up. I, I was, my face was in the snow. I just know he was up some distance and he called falling and the rope came free. And, uh, and I rolled out of the way and he landed half on me and half in the deep snow. By this point, we were elated because the rope was free. And so we stood and I'm going to cut the story really short here. No, this is this is a good story. <laughs> you tell as Whoa. much as you want. Okay. All right. So, so, so the 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 rope comes down. We pull the rope down, and we stand. And now we're uncoordinated because the body stops to function well. Everything starts to freeze. The brain starts to freeze. The blood starts to slow. The, the brain is starved for oxygen. The, the We're still, we're, we're sort of beyond shivering, but we're still shivering, but we're like, that was the body trying to keep itself warm. Now the body's doing other stuff, trying to like figure out what's wrong with it. And and we can't talk because our, because, because every time we talked, we minimalized our speaking because as we spoke, we each felt our, the energy level in our body, if we had a meter, go down, 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 down with every single step and every single motion and every single word. And we decided that we would conserve our energy and speak little. And so we traversed over to the next rappel and we descended down this dirt, uh, pardon me, dark crag Around a corner, we came, we stood on this ledge 100, 150 feet up with two iron pins uh, hammered into the granite mountain with rings, iron rings and carabiners and harnesses, uh, straps rather, nylon straps that clipped to my our harnesses. And Tim was to my left on this ledge and I was to his right and the, and, and the moon, the moon had come up and we could, we could see and uh, what I tied one end of the rope to my harness and I tossed off the other side to pull the rope through the ring and the rope got stuck on the first pull. And now we're in a serious situation. This is many hours after the, after the sun went down. I have no idea how many. I was too busy moving forward with the, this internal drive that I discovered that I had, this deep well of desire to live this like drive to survive, very mammalian like, like, like animalistic drive to live. And now I can't get the rope free and we're stuck for hours. I can't get this rope free. And we know the dire situation that we're in. It becomes quickly apparent as the hours go by that we are not getting out of this. Mm. And so, um, you know, my body turned hot and I unzipped my coat which is a common hypothermic thing and though I knew better and Tim told me zip your coat I didn't care and I became peaceful and I began to understand that really truly I was going to die here and when that idea came into my head I sort of relaxed and I started thinking about my family 
and my spirituality and God. And I accepted the situation that I was in. And then I began to fall asleep and I would fall asleep and I would collapse and I would smack and wake up and, and stand up and yank on the rope and repeat. And, and this one time I stood up again, as I stood up, I saw my peripheral vision become like a spotlight on a stage that fades to black very rapidly. It closed down on me, oh, darkness, darkness, darkness. And I swung my head and could see, it's like tunnel vision, just, oh, but, the, but it was the darkness coming. And when the darkness closed and the light was gone, I didn't lose consciousness. And I thought to myself, why am I not asleep? I am not asleep and I can't see. And then the darkness itself be became deeper and far, 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 infinitely far in the distance, a pinprick of light came, appeared and came rushing toward me and became larger as it came at me and communicated directly to me. It, it, it covered this vast distance in an instant. And as it came to me, it, it communicated, I'm taking you. And I resisted with all of my meager might. And it plucked me like a daisy. And I was carried off. And I realized all powerful, all intelligent, all comforting was this encasement of me, this containment of me, this, this vehicle of, 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 of consciousness carrying me. And I was comforted. And I had no control, even if I wanted to, I could not do anything but go with this power. And I was carried up this proverbial tunnel, but the tunnel was like wide and it was still infinite at the same time. And I suddenly appeared or it, it expanded or I popped through, it's very difficult to know exactly what happened in that, mo that moment, into uh, uh, heaven the this infinite eternal darkness that is paradoxically illuminated i can see i can i can't see infinity but i can see that infinity is beyond my sight and i can see in every direction at once like i i'm a single orb of of an eyeball like my eyeball my orbness my soulness my consciousness was a singular entity with which was my ears were my eyes was my soul was my mind was my thinking i was this one thing i didn't have a body anymore i had no there was no uh there were no quarks no pheromones there was uh not pheromones uh, uh i'm gonna skip that part the there were no quarks there was no molecules there was no there was no um selfness left of my body. There was no thingness left of me. I was a no thing in the middle of nothing. Okay, mm. nothing. And the nothing was full of itself. And I was unafraid. And my first thought was, I am me. This is me. And I am bigger, like it can expanded 10,000 times bigger than I ever was as a human being. And I know, I know this is me. And I had forgotten that this was me. And I, I tell all of this, Todd, in metaphor, but metaphor is the only tool that I have. And I'm in timelessness. I'm in a place of all time and no time all time like linear time but also reversed time and and sideways time and all times that you can't even imagine exist i couldn't understand but they were all concentrated in an eternal now and uh, i use metaphor when i talk because i have no other tool and sure. i tell a sequence because i have no other way so i was knew that i was in this space and there was a a portal opened in front of me, like a doorway, a gateway. Uh, I, I, and it was, it was translucent. Like I could see this, this substance to it. It was uh, transparent. I could see through it. 
and it had some kind of solidity to it as well, all three all at once, and I could see them all. And it was this flowing shimmer, this light, this, this like, like a waterfall of sparkle. And I touched it with my being, like my, my soul self. I moved toward it and touched it, and I was all these things happened at once. I, I was infilled with this uh, all life, all living, all creator, uh, the all in all, the omniscient, the, the all intellect, the, the all powerful flowed inside of me and filled me and showed me myself. It, it showed me that I, had, I was known. I had always been known. There was no part of me that was unknown. It showed me my origin of my creative self, like a photon of one singular one singular superpositioned photon that was both all of the the light of all of the universe all crushed into one star but not a black hole and i was one tiny bit of that separate from it but part of the same thing and i was created I, a creator was telling me you are a creature i made you and didn't mean the peterness of me the body physical but that too but it meant the soulness of me the true origin of myself and i could see this long eternal not quite eternal length of my soul but i i was always in the now but i was also very old beyond ages and i was beloved i was beloved and i heard my name called of my soul and it wasn't peter it was this the, that sound which i can't tell you that creates me as i am where i am right now and i in, in created me in the essence of my being in the very start of myself and i went also because i was utterly known i also <laughs> went through a hell of my own making. I suffered all of the pain that I ever gave away in my life to everybody from their point of view. I was my, I, I had, when I had intentionally or unintentionally caused wounds to anybody else, I, it was my karma to receive those wounds inside of me sort of like they bounced off of that person and stuck into me only only I experienced their pain and I experienced this magnification of their pain which is what their soul felt uh, not what I thought they felt and that was juxtaposed to my own rationales for causing such pain to or or accidentally causing pain that I did not even know about and I judged myself guilty and in the judgment of myself as guilty the I could see that love was the, was the treasure that was given to me and that was being given to me and that had always been given to me by the people who loved me and all the love that I gave away, I got to keep and all the love that was given to me, I got to keep and the, the, the voice, I call it the voice, was speaking inside me. All of the things that I just said, showing and speaking are the same thing and it was showing and speaking inside me, love you love you i know you i made you i always known you i love you i forgive you i forgive you come home come home to my you are my beloved and i was instantly like i turned i turned myself away from my guilt and i looked instead at the light and love and was infilled instantaneously with bliss healing, wholeness, love, adoration, awe, understanding, intellect. I, I, in an instant, I knew everything that I wanted to know, everything I wanted to know, I knew it all. And joy and beauty, just beauty. Uh, and I saw all of humanities, all of humanity is the same as myself. And that there was no, that all the pain we cause each other and the suffering we endure in life ends and we don't have to take it with us and everyone was the same every person was the same as me and it wasn't our fault that the universe was built this way yeah wow that's incredible i can I keep even, going I, I you know I, I haven't let you talk at all todd and i feel weird about that no but. it's okay you know i usually do most of the talking like i well i don't see, usually do most of the talking but my my dad always says i wish you wouldn't talk as much because i want to hear the other people talk <laughs> so <laughs> this is great the story is great but i want to so 
I have, I have like a bajillion questions I want to ask, but I want to keep, but to keep this going, I want to know when did your place in the universe there end? And do you remember coming back and coming back to life? What, what was oh, that yeah. whole catalyst? How did all that happen? Well, when I was in filled with this, I was filled to the, I was filled with this substance. Okay. I'm in the middle of the, of this billion what's the, what's the biggest number you can say gazillion you know it's a hundred bazillion bazillions and yeah. that's how big this was and it was consciousness but it was also right next to me or but i couldn't see it and but it was but it was everything and it was speaking inside me and i said to it am i dead and the voice said yes you're dead and come home come home and I said, but my parents, you know, my sister had run away when I was a kid from, it broke my mom and hurt my dad and broke up the family in a way and caused a lot of suffering. And so I did, I said, I can't take my, another kid from my parents. And I was swept to the edge, of, well, like the edge of the heaven. Like I was instantly carried again with no will of my own, just carried to the edge of heaven where I could see earth. Uh, from this edge of heaven and these things happened at the same time i could see all of earth like a hologram and every single human being on it and everybody's covered with a veil and the veil prevents every single person from seeing what the divine is telling me and showing me i that i that that the love is a, a gazillion times greater than i could possibly say and that it was always was always is and always will be that amount of love available for me, whether I'm living or dead, whether those people are living or dead, whether they know it or not, this love that you now know, the voice says to me, you now know this truth about me is, and this is true for every single person you see, 7 billion people on earth. And I could see, and for your parents too, and that their life will end and that the veil will raise and that they will experience this divine love. And I could see my parents' faces and their anguish, like the, their, the, the, the depth of their anguish over all this, this decade of suffering. And I could see the trajectory of their life without me and I, with me. And I said, I haven't gone through the tunnel. I haven't gone on yet. I haven't, I haven't made the full journey yet. I'm still in this space between do i have to come home can't i go back and help my parents and the voice said to me i want you to come home this is this is your time and i said but you know i haven't gone through it and do i do i have to go or can i if i go back can i come back here to this divine place if i go back to help can i come back to this bliss and the voice said yes you can do that and I said, well, then I choose to live my life. And the voice said, you won't live your life. And phew, sent me back. And, and as I went back, I had this, I had to make, it, it, it commanded me, choose. And in front of me, as I was flying <laughs> across heaven back into the universe, uh, I had all these entry portals. There was like, I I've, been, I've been describing it recently, like the cut end of a, of a huge cable on a suspension bridge. And the, you know, it's all these wrapped wires and they're all next to each other. And there's a million of them. Only, only for me, they're, they're, they're entry points back into my body. And, and they are circuit, it's like a big circle. And in the middle is, the, is this intense beam of the purity of the white light itself. And, and then it radiates out to the edges. And there's no part of this entrance panel that uh, doesn't have the light, but, it's, but the intensity is in the middle. And there were a 10 million, a million entry points for me to choose from. And I remember thinking, I, I want to live a kind of a creative bohemian life. I want to have some, I want to be, I want to be me somewhat. I don't want to go into the divine center where I was being sort of led to the center of the light itself. And I kind of leaned away from it. I, I didn't go right into the middle of it. I went off to the side of it and I entered in and, I, and as I've lived my life, I saw all of the I saw all of the probabilities of my life that I've lived in the moments that I've made the choices. I like live a, a moment before myself all the time. Like, you know, people have deja vus. I, I, I it's it, it 
it, it's but it's not a, a fate okay it's all the willful choices that i've made in my life every single step of the way that make that, that make the future that i'm in out of all of the probable futures that i could have had and because i saw all of the probable futures every single time this thing happens to me which is frequently i i understand that i it's a, it's a consequence of all the choices that i made and right. so over my lifetime i i've chosen to lean I don't know that I always make the right choice. I can I can tell you that my family says I don't. You know, I've made bad choices in my life. But what I try to always do is every choice that I make, I lean into the light. So good point, good choice, or bad choice, I still try to lean into the light with every single choice. And 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 so that was a major consequence of what, of of my life coming back. I I I I, I woke up on the mountain. Uh, I was crushed down like like in a compactor and stuffed, screwed, placed back in my body. And the first thing that I was I was in the place of the, of, of the forgetfulness of suffering. And, and the first thing I learned about when I came back was suffering because my body was it was crude. It was painful. And I. Let's talk about that. So when you live back on the physical plane of Earth now and you've come back to life where were you were you on the mountain again were you in a hospital what do you recall still there? on the mountain still dangling still lying there and uh, still hanging on this lying on the kind of lying half lying off this ledge um because mm -hmm. i'm on a strap and um and so i'm i sw I, sw I sort of sw come into this painful thing that i didn't understand and, and, and it sort of warms up and comes online. And the first thing that comes online for me is, is like pain out of my feet because my feet are blocks of ice. My fingers are frozen. My face is frozen. I got frostbite. I get, I'm frozen to the core and all I feel is physical pain. And then my brain sorts of starts to warm up and starts to work and, and, and I hear sound. And, and, and after a period of time, I feel my body, this body jostling and I hear this voice and I don't know what it is and eventually Tim's pulling me up and pulling me up and pulling me up and I and my body starts to work and I start to climb back up again and I and I look at him and I got my eye I've got eyes open now and I'm like what is this where am I what is this thing that I'm stuck inside of and that noise and and he's screaming at me screaming at me you were dead you were dead if you died I was gonna die and 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 I was like what is what is, what happened to me uh, I, I so so tim confirms that you died there yeah wow how does he how long were you, do you think you were dead don't know uh hmm. neither of us were head watches and neither of us you know were like paying attention at the time we were just trying to live so i don't really it could have been a second and, you know and I how know. and and how did how did you eventually make it off the mount off the mountain well you know I, <clears> for hours i've been trying to yank on that cable uh, on that uh rope rather and uh i couldn't get it free and so tim told me what to do uh, because I, because I could understand English now and uh, I pulled on the rope and it came free in the first pull and we mm -hmm. descended and we went to our tent and we treated for hypothermia and once we were warm enough um, I, I ju once I judged that we were warm enough we got into the car and fired up the heater and well, survived and did you have uh, any lasting damage from that did you have severe frostbite what was I was there anything have, else that I, I didn't lose any digits. Um, I've got damage. Um, I, 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 everybody, I, I, let's put it this way. I've been wearing a mask I'm, uh, way before it was Vogue. Okay, I wore it. The temperature goes below 45 degrees and I've got a scarf on my face because my face hurts, my nose hurts, my cheeks hurt, my chin hurts, my ears hurt, my fingers hurt. I can't feel the bottom of my big toe, but I have all my digits. And, and it, yeah. really, it really wrecked my internal thermometer. My internal internal yeah. thermometer has been like haywire ever since. How did your life change after that incident? Do you, you, I imagine you must have thought about this event that happened to you over and over after that. What was what happened to you after that kind of oh, mentally and physically? Well, it wasn't like the event ended. It was like I came back, but but I I came back as a 
I came back as a stranger in a strange land. It was ongoing. That was the craziest thing about it was that it, it even though I wasn't where I was before, when I understood 100% and I could only hear, understand 1% of what had happened to me, what I saw, but the about 100% of the world had shifted. I, I'm in my body. I look just like the same guy I was before, but I am not the same person. Uh, everything, everything... Let me put it this way. Everything looked flat and ugly to me. Everything looked like I was in a, in a, in a black and white 1930s silent movie with grain. It's very grainy and it's poorly, it's poorly designed and poorly put together. And as beautiful as, as earth is and as beautiful as people can be, it was all very flat to me. And I was lost. I, 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 I was an alien and I can't, I can't really tell you how radically different everything looked to me, including myself. I was as if I was sitting on a chair at the top of a set of stairs, looking down through a lens on the first floor. And everybody thought that I was the lens on the first floor, but I'm up on the stairs. I'm looking through myself out into the world and I'm still connected to the divine. And I still know that I'm, I can hear, I can hear inside me, my name being called that same voiceless expression of myself being made. It's, it's like resounding inside me. And it's so this, this, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't just the physical aspects of it. It was this entire perspective shift. It was like, it was like when, to go to the black and white again, it was like in the 1960s when suddenly Technicolor came online and, and people switched from black and white to color TVs. Uh, it, it, it was much more radical than that, but I'm at a loss for a metaphor for it. So to express the, the, the immensity of it. So every eating was weird walking was weird having to have any sort of physical thing was weird having to open a jar was weird having to listen to music was weird everything around my whole world was completely upset and i i ended up having a hitchhike we tim and i uh, long story short some terrible things happened okay as bad as that night was other bad things happened and as it as it was we ended up with no car and um, i had to hitchhike back to bozeman and tim took the bus with a bunch of our gear and i was i felt incredibly utterly alone and that feeling of aloneness lasted for most of my life it hmm. just but but aloneness in the world and i eventually realized that the only way i was going to understand and overcome my non-attachment to the world was to aim my entire interior world at the divine itself and 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 try to cling to it for life and balance and stability and because because i i, I couldn't talk about this thing this is crazy so I, I i kept it a secret um i was going to be i was an english major i was going to be an architect in the family business uh that was the expectation in my family for decades i even was working in construction you know, working for contractors during the summer so that i could you know, deal with the that end of the understand those sorts of things and the people who work there and and be able to be that front guy and and uh sis, my sister was already headed off to architecture school and so i didn't do that uh, I came back a very different person and I went to, I, I decided to become a Trappist monk because I had had some exposure to the Trappist monks and their, and the depth of their spirituality was very clear to me. Uh, I could see their radiance. I could see, I could see, okay, this is, I know how kooky this stuff sounds, which is why I kept my mouth shut for so many years. I see people, I see people's radiance I, all the time. It's like, it's always there. It's, and it's not just in human beings, it's in plants and it's in dogs and it's in birds. And it's like, it's like, uh, how do you tell people that? And you know, I, I, uh, I, com I completely subscribe to everything that you're saying here. I want to I want to pose a question to you, though. A lot of psychologists would call maybe what you were going through PTSD. How would you uh, how would you address that? Someone I would saying say, that everything you're suffering from is just that. Oh, well, well, I would divide that thing into two. I would divide that. I would say 
um, I, I have said I do have PTSD. Uh, that night, I had really bad PTSD from that night. And the next night, it, it was it was terrible and terrifying. And the terrible things that happened to me in the in the consequences of my life just exacerbated that. And I've finally begun to deal with that, uh, you know, four or five years ago. So yes to the PTSD, no to the radical shift because. So this is what I did. I, I didn't know. Um, so now I'm, this is hindsight taught. So I'm telling you 40 years out. But at the time, I like thought I was going to go crazy. I thought, what is this crazy? Am I insane? Who else is like this? Nobody, no books about this. So I was going to go to where I thought I could learn something, which is from the Trappist monks, but I decided not to do that. I decided to go to graduate school, like was planned, but I went to go study mysticism. So I studied mysticism at Yale and I did a three-year master's degree uh, under the tutelage because they didn't teach about mysticism, but they had a lot of courses and resources. So I created my own course of study under one of the deans um, and I learned a language and, and explored the history of what classical Western mysticism, which expanded into uh, Eastern mysticism as well. But that's a different part of the tale. And so I came to understand that these people, these mystical geniuses, I'm like them. And, and I know how weird that sounds, but my, the only people who were my peers, who I understood well, people like Meister Eckhart and the Cloud of Unknowing and Teresa of Avila and Julian of Norwich and Hildegard of Bengen, when I read these people, and the list goes on and on and on, and when I read these people, I saw in their descriptions, using metaphor, because that's the language of mystics, I saw in their descriptions my experience. I saw where they went, I went. And what they understood, I understood. And so I began to um, recognize that it, the the because inside I knew it was real, but but I'm in the world. How can how can I I can't prove this thing to anybody? I can't show this thing to anybody. It's all subjective. What do I do with it? I learned to dive inside myself. I learned that the only way, it, all the knowledge in the world that I could accrue for uh, explanation and self discovery self-realization some might say is no good to me in terms of my the because it's all based in the physical world it's all physical stuff it's all matter and and thingness and what i crave is thinglessness and so i aimed i i used the, what i studied and learned about practices of prayer and i spent the last 40 years of my life banking on it um practicing different forms of spirituality to carve a path inside myself back to my origin so that I could find stability in the world, which it has given me that, and also to by giving me a deeper soul connection to the oneness of being, which which I want to make sure that I that people understand this about me is that it's not ever about me. I know that my even my ego, my my body, my brain, it's all thingness, and the only thing that is not thingness, the only thing that is reality itself with a capital R, is the divine being, and that's that's the truth of of myself. And so, and so I always aim for that, which is larger than me, from which I come and from which everybody comes. Everybody's like that. Everybody is beloved. Everybody. What do you say to people that say that this was all maybe just happening in your brain, that maybe your brain was secreting a chemical that was putting you at ease as you were dying? What, how would you address that? I sure hope science continues to look to find out the truth of that. I want. Yeah. I'm. I'm. A, I'm a supporter of the exam of, of the scientific studies, and a reader of Bruce Grayson and Sam Parnia. So a couple of uh, docs who study this kind of stuff. And I want science to to dig deep, dig deep, dig deep. Um, yeah. And and maybe it'll turn out that they're right. Maybe it'll turn out that it was all serotonin. But <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> I think I think that that uh, it's far too common an experience. Uh, tens I agree tens. with that. I agree with that. And uh, these, uh, these, the similar narrative that are told by a lot of different people that never met. Have you? Do you ever have a dream or a vision that triggers the moments around the NDE? Uh, I, I, I the weird thing for me is is that is that I didn't have a brain when I was dead, and yet I remember so much of it. And and I, 
I, and I live with it. So it's this ongoing experience. It doesn't like I have to remember it. It's like it's always present with me. It's like my breath. It's always right here, right now. Even if I, I try, I can get rid of it for a while. I can distract myself, but it's always present. And so there's that part of it. Um, but meditation, my life of meditation and uh, Kriya yoga, so like a Kriya yoga uh, or a Vispassana kind of yoga I use in my Hatha practice, um, it, it, sort of, it thins the veil inside me and makes present the divine uh, in, a, in, a, in a way over which I have no power sometimes. Sure. Um, and so um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, does it? It does. It does. So let's talk about the heart attack in 2015. How was this experience the same or different? Uh, it was different uh, and similar. Uh, it, it was, I have a, con, a, a congenital thing in my family and uh, killed, you know, killed a bunch of people in my family. Let's just say that. Mm -hmm. And so I had a heart attack and I got rushed, but it took hours because I live in a very rural place uh, to get to the catheterization lab, which is an hour and a half from my house. And I was already an hour into the event by the time I left for the catheterization lab. So that's, that was bad off, bad just to begin with. And on the way down in the ambulance on a Saturday in Maine, in Maine summer traffic, um, I died and I came out of my body. I, I, this is what happened. I, I heard, I heard the, the, the paramedic radio in and say, we're losing him. And so I opened my own and I'm not on morphine. I'm not on any drugs at all. Cause I can't take, I can't take opiates. I'm, I'm sensitive to opiates. They make me super sick. Um, and so I'm meditating to control my pain. It's like an elephant standing on my heart on one foot. And I'm meditating because that's one of the great things about meditation. You can control your pain if you're staring at it in meditation. And I'm not the only one who says so. It's a long standing thing. And so I'm using meditation to control my pain. And I hear her say, we're losing him. And, and I open my eyes and I look at her and, and I close my eyes. And when I close my eyes uh, to, because my pain's back again, because I'm not meditating, I'm out of my body and I'm now above my body in a darkness, I can still see my body, but I'm in this comfortable darkness and behind me, I turn and now I'm, now I'm, I'm like a, a astral self, spirit self, not soul consciousness self. And I turn and, and my angel is coming toward me, this angel of light, this, this all powerful, all intellect that had collected me before. And I recognize him like, Hey, you know, I finally get to go home. I've been wanting to go home for so many years, decades, and I start to go and it's the, it's communicating to me. I love, come home, love, welcome. It's your time, come home. And so I start to go and then I think to myself, well, wait a second, let me make sure everything's good. Um, and so I, I, I turn around and I look inside myself again. And when I was in the urgent care center, my son who was like 24, 26 at the time, um, was there and he, he grabbed my hand and he leans in and he, and he looks me in the eyes. He's really close to my face. I love you, dad, he says. And my wife's there and she's squeezing my hand and, I, and the look on her face is not good. And, and I got loaded in the, in the ambulance. And on the, at, after, okay, when I was at, in ICU, after I was in ICU, my son told me that the doc had told him to say goodbye to me because I was gonna die on the way. That was like too much time had passed, too long a drive, he's gonna die say goodbye to your dad. And so I look inside myself and I see him saying that to me. And I think, oh my God, he's not really ready yet. I can see it in his eyes. He needs me here. And then I think about my daughter who's just you know, left her high school sweetheart who she married while she was in college. And he went off to Afghanistan and terrible, terrible things happened. And she'd had a baby and she had just left him. And who's going to protect them? And who's going to be the, the dad for this baby? And and I thought, I have to do this. I have to be there for this kid. And so I turn around and I look back up at the angel and the angel, and I'm out of, I'm outside of my body again. And I'm kind of going back up the tunnel and the angel comes rushing down toward me, this orb of light and welcomes me and loves me. And I just turn away. And I think I must've communicated, I'm staying. And I, I turned away and I went back in my body. And now, okay, so now it's, She's gonna have her sixth birthday in a couple of weeks. Um, and she was just been born at this time. So wow. so I guess the, the thing, that, and I don't know why this is because I got to choose twice to come back and both times I chose to come back to help somebody, help my parents not suffer as much. And my, both my dad's, he's 90, my mom's 89 and he's had a real rough couple of years. And 
you know, he's got, he's looking at the, at the end now. And so, you know, I've been, I've spent my life with them far and I live in Maine, they live on Cape Cod, but I've spent my life with them. Um, so that they didn't suffer so much. And now I'm trying to protect my granddaughter. Wow. That's the, that's not the right word anymore. That's it's more like, uh, be the father for her. That's what I'm Yeah. Talking. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Should people fear death? No. Absolutely zero Zippo not. So, so that is a huge thing that happened. I, I, two, two really big things that happened when I went the first day that I woke up from my first death. A, um, I don't have any more beliefs. I don't believe in culture or politics. I participate in culture and politics and religion because that's kind of what we do here on earth, um, especially if someone in my position. But, but I don't believe in any of them. None of them are real. I, only I, do, I am not a believer in heaven. I am not a believer in God. I am not a believer in the Bible. I am a, I know that God is love. I know God is real. And, and people can believe me or not believe me. I don't really care because I know where I'm going. And from the day that I died the first time until the day I died the second time, I prayed for my death every single day. Take me home. I want to go home. Take me home. And so I, I, I was utterly unafraid on the day I died of a heart attack. I was completely at ease. I was the most at ease person in the entire scenario. And wow. of all the people involved, I was completely calm because I knew I was going home. I was going home. Yeah. Now you've, you've written books about your experiences. Tell, tell the listeners about the books you've written. Uh, I, I wrote a, I had a TV show for 15 years here in Maine and on um, two NBC stations. And I wrote 1500 devotional stories, ecumenical stories of love for inspiration and hope. And in, in, in that book, I toyed with the idea of coming out of the closet for near death experience. And so there's a, there's a few stories in the book about that, about me dying, but I didn't reveal that it was me. Uh, and so, and that was an experiment and that became a main bestseller. And so then I wrote another book called Heaven is Beautiful, uh, that first book was Two Minutes for God, and this one is uh, Heaven is Beautiful, How Dying Taught Me That Death is Just the Beginning. And I I came out of the closet in a big way with that um, because, in part because it was people were asking me to come out of it, to tell the, to tell the story. And so I did, and it's become an audible international bestseller, and it's uh, both books are sold all around the world all the time and i'm i'm working on new stuff now i just sold uh in the past year uh, my rights to that second book to um, a couple of big producers in hollywood and we're deep into development uh, we've been we've already been working on it for nine months together and they're making a feature film and wow. that is that's we we just reached a milestone last week and we have another milestone coming up in the next couple of weeks and then it's off to the races and 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 then um working on my uh, working on another book too uh that i've that i've, I've actually already written for that too so i'll have yeah. I, I should have two more books coming out in the next couple of years good good and what, what's your work primarily focused on today what's what message are you putting out there love god is love fear not next question that's, no, what am that's, I doing? <laughs> what enough I'm doing? said that's really <laughs> that's it you know um so i'm i'm doing a couple things i'm doing a a i counsel i counsel uh spiritual problems uh mystics near-death experiencers people who've had uh, experiences that they need to bounce off of somebody or people who are who are seekers who w want uh some either direction or mentorship or those sorts of things and then i'm running this thing i have a youtube channel uh, it's called not church because you know i was ordained the united church of christ minister I'm, i was always, I'm, i was all i was the i was the a star in maine and a bad boy uh, in the united church of christ i was i was equally as much trouble as i was um helpful i think in the denomination uh, i didn't do very well with the rule sets so i started not church uh, not church is uh, no dogma do, no doctrine no bs mysticism primarily in the scriptures but also the non-canonical like the gospel of thomas and i bring in uh, eastern uh, religion as well as uh, and sufism and a bunch of other stuff it's an it's it's an exploration because all mystics speak the same language it doesn't matter where they're from every one of us speaks in metaphor and so and i'm a i'm a literary metaphorist i guess you could say and so i look at the scriptures 
mostly from the Bible, the sayings of Jesus and deconstruct them and reconstruct them as I think that he meant to speak them because he was talking, he's a code switcher. So I, code switching is speaking two languages at once, you Franglish or Spanglish or Greeklish. Um, Jesus was talking Aramaic and metaphor, just like every, you know, Lao Tzu was talking with some Mandarin and whatever he spoke, uh, I'm not sure which form of Chinese and, and metaphor. Um, so not church on Sunday mornings is a live hour broadcast. I talk for maybe 20 minutes um, and I've got, we've got people from all over the world who, who come and listen and participate in the chat, the live chat afterwards. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to, um, this is what I think happened. I think that in, in the Council of Nicaea, I think that the, the church fathers got it wrong and I'm not the only one who thinks this, when they made Jesus the only begotten son, because I don't think that's what Jesus was saying. I think he was revealing the light inside himself most powerfully in saying that everybody has that light too. And it's available to you right now inside you. All you have to do is look for it and keep looking at it. And um, you'll be like me is what he was saying. And yeah. so I'm doing that, which makes me a heretic, um, which I hope increases my audience because I think there's a lot of people who, who think what I'm saying is right. Well, that's that's a great way to wrap the podcast up. And I think those are beautiful words, really. What you're saying is uh, is uh, is really amazing. Uh, you mentioned the YouTube page. Where else can people find you out there on the interwebs? Are you uh, on social media? I'm on social places? media. Mm -hmm. And you have a .com as well. I do. It's uh, peterpanagor.love. That's my, you know, my main contact, but I'm on Twitter and I'm on Instagram and uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. And I, you know, I'm not on Reddit much, but I, but I, I'm a reader every so often. Yeah. Uh, I saw so out there. You can, all those links are at my website, peterpanagor.love. Perfect. Peter, I really appreciate you telling your story today. It was just really, really incredible. I just enjoyed sitting and listening during this one. It was uh, such a compelling story. And I hope you come back again and do a, a future episode with me. I will definitely do that. Thank you very much, Todd. It was great. And I, I feel like I monopolized the situation. I'd rather have a conversation, <laughs> um, but, uh, but, I, but I would love to come back and have a conversation with you. Yeah, for sure. Well, there wasn't much to really have a conversation about. It was all your journey. So it was like, I just wanted to hear it. Like that was just so amazing. So, but I really appreciate you uh, telling everyone this and we'll do this again for sure. Thank but you, uh, thanks for coming out today. I appreciate you having me. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Have a good day. There you have it. My interview with Peter Panagor. I hope you enjoyed it. Have you had a near-death experience? If you have, email me. I'd like to hear about it. You can email me at questwithtodd at gmail.com. You can also leave a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash metatomics. And I'll see you next week on Quest. Thank you for listening to Quest. Please be sure to rate and review this podcast. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other new content. And make sure to pick up a copy of the book that started the spiritual revolution, Metatomics the Grand Design, available for sale online and at most major bookstores.